Whenever we read that gospel, or whenever I read it from, this, from the pulpit, I always expect the left hand of the church to move over to the right, you know? <laughs> Nobody wants to be caught on the wrong side, you know? Almost a century ago, well, a century ago, uh, actually after the Great War, that the First World War, what was called the Great War before the Second World War came, after that Great War, the Euro Europe remained in turmoil. Many countries disappeared as new ones emerged in their place. The map of Europe was redrawn after a generation almost of men in every place was slaughtered for, for what? In the end, next to nothing, except for the freedom that democracy wanted, of course, and demanded. But sad to say, in that turmoil, in that economic turmoil and, and all kinds of things that were happening, uh, Stalin rose in the Communist Party and sprouted in, in uh, Russia, and uh, Mussolini and fascism took hold in Italy, and Hitler gained a voice in German politics, and so on and so forth, and we know that that led to the Second World War, of course. But among all this, in the beginning of that century, after the Great War, Pope Pius XI saw how this nationalism and the love of country above all else was damaging, and also secularism was on the rise as well, that goods were becoming more important and people were focusing on the wrong things. And so he was seeing more and more that religion was having less and less of a place in the affairs of the states around him. And it was rapidly gaining a foothold and he thought, of course, that needed to be challenged, of course, as it always does. And so in 1925, he released a papal encyclical called Quas Primus, naming Jesus Christ, the Lord of all creation, that feast that we celebrate today, the King of the universe. He wanted, of course, to remind all Christians that their ultimate allegiance was to their spiritual leader in heaven and not to any earthly power, person, or state. And this feast day used to be celebrated on the last Sunday of October, but it was changed and we now celebrate it on the last Sunday of the church year right before the start of Advent, which will start next Sunday. But we look at Christ's kingship differently than we would any other leaders, kings, queens, emperors, dictators, or presidents, whatever it is. Those are men and women of power over this world, and their power should be limited, of course. They're not kings or princes or, or queens or presidents of the universe, after all. Christ is the only one with that power. And Christ is a kingship, but in a different way. We're told he is a shepherd. He is like a shepherd who provides for his people. That's why we use that beautiful Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd, there is nothing I shall want. He leads me in green pastures. He leads me to, to fresh waters. He protects me from the wolves and all the evils that are out there as it's described also in the prophet Ezekiel in that first reading, he will be a shepherd for his people. And then Paul explains in that letter to the Corinthians that Christ will come and he will reign for a time, but that time will end and then the, the ultimate consummation of all history will take place in the final judgment. And that's where that story from our gospel comes. It's frightening, like I say. He separates the peoples as sheep from goats. And he says, those on the left have not done anything for him because they have not done anything for the least of the, the, the brethren. And so they go off to eternal punishment. And then the righteous, of course, who have done things will go to the life of heaven. Christ will weigh, in other words, his followers' treatment of their neighbors in need. That's what he's going to judge us on. Usually anything, though, anytime we bring up this discussion regarding the final judgment, as I say, it's, uh, it gives us deep and anonymous thoughts about our own individual judgment, right? We know that when we get to the throne of God, I hope all of us, and myself including, I know that I will be shaking in my boots because I know that I have sinned. I have sinned like everyone else, and I hope that Christ can have mercy on me, and I pray for that, that I get into heaven, but there is no such guarantee. I will throw myself on that mercy of that court. And what is known, though, that Jesus' second coming will be different, will be different from 
that first coming. We know that the birth of Christ signifies what kind of king Jesus would be. He was born in a crude stable, we remember, in that wooden manger, and he was warmed by his mom and dad and, and the little surrounding animals that were with him. But his coronation came 33 years later. And what we call his coronation was very, very different. It wasn't the coronation that we would expect to see in a, a king or a queen or an emperor or even a, an inauguration of a president or a, a prime minister or the, 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 even the popes, you know, uh, coming into, into being as, as leader of the church. Those are joyous events. And we say, you know, well, we don't say because we have a president, but in like places in England, they say, God save the queen, God save the king. We could say the same thing, God save the president, but at a coronation, it's joyous and happy. But Christ's was very different. His coronation happened on the cross when jeering and not jeering crowds followed him to Calvary. His crown of thorns pressed deeply into his head not like a crown of glory on a king, a human king or queen. His blood soaked his garment, and that's what made it red from the scourging. His throne was a wooden cross that he carried through that pain-filled coronation. No trumpets hailed his arrival at Calvary. Instead, we're told, of course, that the sound of hammering nails through his hands, causing him to rise in agony. It was not a joyous moment for him, and it should not, of course, be a joyous moment for us. But the mobs shouted, and they shouted clear, if you are king of the Jews, save yourself. They mocked him. That's the kind of coronation Christ our king had, at least here on earth. Of course, in heaven, it was a joyous event altogether different. Jesus chooses, though, instead of saving himself, as they're asking him and yelling at him to do, he does something different, and it shows what kind of a king he is. His last act was a merciful act. He had heard that thief on the other cross say, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And although he was a sinner, Christ turned to him, we know, and said, this very day you will be with me in paradise. What a beautiful response. What a beautiful king to care about us in our last moments more than he cares for himself, dying on a cross. Earlier, of course, Jesus had preached, we know, and I've been saying this for the few weeks, the greatest commandment is to love the Lord our God with our whole heart, our soul, and our mind, and to love our neighbor as we love ourselves. And I've said that often. We, anybody that, that does not love themselves needs a little help, right? They need therapy. So we want to love ourselves so that we can love our neighbor. And of course, we put God before anything else. That's the kind of king that Jesus is, the kind of king that died for love of his people, not counting his own cost, not looking at himself and saying, oh, you know, save me, save me, save me, but that he did it, that he willingly went to the cross because he knew through that sacrifice that he could help us get to the life of heaven. We are the neighbors he continues to save, or our king wants no one at all to punishment. This day, to this day, this king commands us at every Eucharist, and you hear this at every mass that we celebrate, right after the consecration, part of it, do this in memory of me. That is the way Christ wants us to be. He wants us to remember that we should sacrifice for one another. And we should always remember that our true allegiance, our final allegiance, is to him, is to God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, because no one else can bring us to heaven. Amen. <laughs>